What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 196 at block height 601,942 on Friday, November 1st. So what's going on today, Janine? Uh, this is going to be kind of an odd dynamic today with just us. Yep, still reckless and now paraless, I guess. It's going to be interesting. Uh, but let's 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 see how this. Uh, I don't know the the speaking time when <laughs> I'm getting split up. And user just totally nailed a way better pun. Like just just no para. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. So I guess uh, you know, fuck it. Let's just dive right into it. Uh. First up, uh, two things that got lost between the cracks last week. Uh, there, there was so much stuff uh, we had to cover because of missing the prior week's episode. Uh, we literally, or I rather, missed two things uh, in putting the order together. So first up is old news that Ernst & Young uh, is planning a lot of really long-term stuff with Ethereum. And the real interesting part here to me is that uh, pretty much everything they're doing is right on the nose except the choice to use Ethereum. Uh, they, they've developed their own, um, I think it's called Nightfall protocol for zero knowledge proofs uh, built on Ethereum and are effectively trying to build out a, a very wide system step by step that would allow businesses to privately settle things on a public blockchain with private smart contracts so that they have that, that public base, um, but they're not exposing all kinds of private information about the internals and, and revenue of their business. And that's, you know, the way you should be looking at things, but picking Ethereum was a huge fuck up. It doesn't have a sound monetary base. It doesn't really have a sound um, consensus guarantee uh, in terms of that being predictable. It doesn't even have sound smart contract primitives for basic operations like transacting and multi-sig. Uh, it just leaves that in open mess undefined at the base layer. So it, it's really kind of sad. And I think what we're going to see here is a very stark contrast uh, with Ernst & Young versus Fidelity, uh, for instance. And Ernst & Young is going to wind up learning some very hard, expensive lessons um, in terms of the platforms they pick to build on. And should we just move right along? Yep, I have no, <laughs> I have no thoughts on this one. I, you, you need to like give me a uh, a signal at some point in, in, in chat when I'm like into the meat of a topic on whether whether you think you're gonna have anything on that. But the the, the other forgotten soldier from last week is Bitmain opening a mining farm in Texas, uh, and this is something we've actually covered multiple times. Uh, that that was kind of up in the air after the whole IPO fall through in Hong Kong and just the, the horrible financial year they've been having, but this has moved forward. So they're opening a, a new headquarters and a 50 megawatt mining center in Texas. In contrast with, um, what was the, um, sorry guys, brain fart. Uh, 
layer one, um, the Peter Thiel led um, mining operation open in Texas that the digital uh, currency group invested in. Um, and that this is happening. So they are actually, you know, slowly making progress in trying to open up these, you know, sites for their actual hardware operations outside of China's jurisdiction, despite all of the financial chaos that they're going through. And so that, that kind of slipped through the, the whole cracks here. And that is pretty much the, the missed stuff from last week. So that I think takes me into a nice long rant about my favorite thing, Xiaomi and eCash. So I saw this um, in between now and the last episode when Nick Zabo retweeted about this. And it's actually being developed by somebody in your neck of the woods, if I remember correctly, uh, Jimmy. And it is, it, it is my favorite design for the, these systems that I've seen so far. I mean, there's some skepticism I have at the, the level of the, the data structures and, and how those are set up. But other than that, the, the general gist of this is awesome. Um, first, of all, or first of all, it's set up um, ignoring the base layer backing. So the what this is backed by or what you um, deposit to get these tokens for or redeem them for is completely left outside of the scope of this system. So you can plug anything into this. This is just build the uh, deposit and withdraw system for Bitcoin. And this works with that. Um, second is it is federated. So the whole gist here is that there is no single mint involved in any of this. There is a, a federation or quorum of multiple mints. And the signing process to create a legitimate token is effectively um, M of N. And you require M of the N signatures in a mint quorum uh, to have a valid token from that quorum. And the, the way this is set up is that in an optimistic situation, um, when you go to get a token redeemed and a new one issued, you would take the token data and the signatures from each mint and you would send the token data and only the signature for that mint to each of the respective mints it would validate that it hasn't been spent before that the signature is valid and return the new token only with their signature and in the spending process you would wind up with a token signed by everybody in the quorum and it's just a federated cycle like this but in the situation of a mint going down and not being available for that, uh, the M of N threshold allows you to prove that your token has been signed by other mints and the server can verify that in its own spent table it hasn't been spent before and still um, you know, recognize this, issue a new token and the federation uh, can effectively deal with that mint being offline if it's permanent. And the next time they cycle keys um, for token signing, just change the membership of the federation. And another interesting aspect of this is a concept called the ac or access control script in the actual data structure of a token. Um, and this pretty much allows when you spend a token, um, to add conditions such as a signature from specific keys in order for that token spend to be valid. And so this actually allows a nice auditable um, you know, proof of transaction where if I pay you money, I have proof that I paid you. Or if uh, a server tries to claim that I spent a token that I didn't, I can demand they, they provide the signature and they won't have it if I didn't actually spend the token. So it's, it's a nice auditability built into the structure of the token. And um, that could be extended to a lot more stuff. 
like pretty much uh, just the mints effectively enforcing smart contract conditions if you want to extend this and like the, the yeah like the, this that's pretty much the the tldr uh, you can actually go through the white paper in the show notes uh, if you want to really dive deep into the system but i think this is very promising and i like the fact that the entire system right now is designed without considering what these tokens are backed by so it's very flexible uh, extendable and you can effectively just plug it on top of whatever you want uh, to back it with so I, I i'm very hopeful that this might actually go the distance of getting something online people might actually use and and now i'm gonna i'm gonna actually press you for a comment haha <laughs> Imagine. But I don't I don't have any comments. It's 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 a badass cypherpunk thing, some some dude over by youth building. Do you have a federation behind it? Yep, that's the, the whole gist of it. It's why it's amazing. You have federated like bank networks. This, this no, is... I mean, I mean, like a federation, like the Libra Federation. No, you don't need that kind of federation. In fact, um, by introducing a bond into um, this whole system, so pretty much the 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 design in the the white paper is that you would take the total um, number of people in the federation and break those into subgroups. And then each member would take a bond and split it up evenly between multi-sigs and those subgroups. And any attempt to conspire with, uh, you know, other Federation members to do something malicious, um, if you set this up pseudonymously, can only work with cryptographic key-based identities. So anybody even trying to make that initial proposal to do something malicious has a cryptographic proof now that that person is trying to be malicious and their bond can be confiscated in these little subgroups. So there's even a design in this for like pseudonymous members in a uh, federation to actually keep each other in check. No par, where are you? I wanna ramble about privacy tech. Alrighty. Alrighty. No, Para is probably sleeping. Rats. Alright. Well, let's move along to the next one. Bact is going to be launching Bitcoin options on their futures on December 9th. So, pretty much what this means is um, that these are going to be European style options. So you can only exercise the, the option right at the expiration window. But um, you can buy the option to buy or sell Bitcoin at a specific strike price. And this is going to be backed by the, the futures. So pretty much the option is based on the futures contracts, which can physically settle in Bitcoin. And this has been self-certified through the CFTC, um, and it's just going live. And so this is pretty fucking awesome. Like right after we, we saw a nice volume spike on the backed futures, um, they're announcing even more types of products um, building off of that. And it's really like they're, I think they're just getting started. Like there's going to be more and more of these different contract types for institutional investors to interact with the market in the different ways that they're used to in traditional markets. And I think this is going to just keep slowly building up steam. So uh, yeah, this is pretty cool. Uh, I'm sure Janine uh, is going to not have anything to say on this. So no, that that pri that privacy girl does not have an opinion on this. No. Well, I'll give us give us your opinion on Zuckerberg and Congress and all that shenanigans. I know you have one on that. Yeah, I do. Um, 
One second. So uh, we apparently still need to talk about Libra, but maybe not for much longer because Mark Sugar Mountain, I mean Zuckerberg, testified in front of Congress on October 23rd, which is more than a week ago now. Um, but if you didn't watch the entire thing, you don't have to watch it because there's an annotated transcript of his testimony and that was provided by Nathaniel Whitmore via Doctroid. Uh, if you want to read that, it's going to be linked in the description. Um, and in his introduction for his testimony, Zuckerberg said, We've faced a lot of issues over the past few years, but I'm sure people wish it was anyone but Facebook putting this idea forward. Absolutely, but of course only Facebook would put this idea forward. Uh, and then he says, but there's a reason we care about this. Facebook is about putting power in people's hands. Our services give people voice to express what matters to them and to build businesses that create opportunity. Giving people control of their money is important too. The only problem is you're not going to be giving people control of their money. You're going to be putting the control of people's money into the hands of Libra Association slash Facebook and all the other companies that are partnering on this. So you're not really giving people power. Um, just as you're not giving people power much over social media, you're, you're giving a small group of people power over a lot of people on Facebook. Anyway, a comment from him, which um, it wasn't as alarming um, as he said it, uh, based on what the headlines wrote, but um, one of the things that he was quoted as saying is that Libra, uh, if Libra is not allowed to move forward, then China will threaten U.S. dominance over the world financial system. And he kind of does say that, but not as arrogantly. And not in, at least his word choice is not as arrogant. But he does say that if America doesn't innovate, our financial leadership is not guaranteed. And China is going to put out similar payment systems, and we need to do this. Um, he also said, I want to be clear, Facebook will not be part of launching the Libra payment system anywhere in the world until U.S. Until US regulators approve, which, again, like, um, well, I don't know where he said it, but he was also quoted as saying that um, Libra was going to be a centralized alternative to other payment systems. And it's like, well, wait a second, the whole white paper said this was going to eventually be decentralized. So I guess they've given up on that. And if you're basically subjecting this decentralized payment system to the approval of U.S. regulators, uh, that's also not very censorship resistant. Um, and then on the topic of identifying users, Zuckerberg said, we also believe Libra presents an opportunity to strengthen the fight against financial crimes like money laundering and terrorism financing. A lot of illicit activities are funded through cash. A digital payment system with regulated on and off ramps and proper know your customer practices is easier to secure and law enforcement and regulators can conduct their own analysis of on-chain activity. So, so much for privacy. I guess they gave on the, up on that too. So I really don't see a single benefit to this um, unless you, you know, it's basically going to have a, it's possibly going to have a similar benefit as, you know, things like, uh, what is it called? Um, I can't even remember the name of it. The stable coin in Ethereum. <laughs> Shinobi, do you remember? I can't yeah. remember right now. Die, yes, die. It's kind of like that article about the guy from Argentina saying that he's been doing great living off of die because that's what he gets paid in. And it's like, yeah, basically this Libra thing is going to be that maybe for people in countries that their currency is so fucked that literally anything is better. But I don't see much benefit overall. And certainly this is not something that we would want people to be using in the long term because of the financial surveillance. Um, overall, I thought it was a very underwhelming and naive sounding testimony designed to make Congress people feel safe. But after all of Facebook's fuck ups, I would be surprised if anyone is genu genuinely convinced by any of this. Um, there is also that funny moment because uh, in his testimony, he claimed that, you know, they're very diverse and they consider diversity to, to, to be very important to them. And then one of the Congress people actually asked, like, how many people 
people of color or on the team or something. And I don't even know if he answered, but there's all these clips of him gulping very nervously. So I assume that the answer was not great, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure that this, the, I, I don't know. I, unless Facebook is actually going to, I mean, cause consider how many, how many people in the U S government use things like Facebook to do their campaigning. Um, Facebook could always, you know, as much as they claim that they're putting power in people's hands through social media, they could very easily manipulate that power in retaliatory ways uh, if they don't get their way. So, yeah, I'm. This is going to be ugly, but honestly, there's like no, there's no way in hell that Facebook and any of their partners is going to come up with anything that's worth using in the long term. It's just not happening. Like, I mean, think about it. Like, he's pretty much sitting there in fucking Congress. Like, guys, come on. I'm building you another surveillance platform. I just want to make money off of it. Like, it's it's done. This, this, is, this isn't happening. Like, and especially the, the, the attempts to kind of play off the, the China dynamic. Like, that's so stupid, naive. Like that that that's a mile away obvious that it's just a power play. It's just, yeah. It's, yeah. And I don't I don't remember. I think I've I might have said it in the last episode, but it boggles my mind that Zuckerberg saying that he can like or implying that he can save US financial dominance uh with china by using libra i don't know how he thinks that's going i don't see how he thinks that's a comforting thing because congress by my guess would immediately think well wait a second why does he think that they have all this power to save us like that that actually i would think that would make them more hostile to him not the other way around Yeah, I know. It's just, he's, like, it's so stupid. Like, you know, really one day, like, I want, like, the, the, that whole Bitcoin billionaires book, uh, somebody got you that seemed incredibly retarded. I, fuck that book. I want to see the postmortem after the Winklevi at least relatively do well with Bitcoin. Uh, and and shit just implodes for Zuckerberg, and I want to see the shit going on there. I, I want that story. Because like seriously, like just think about how different this would have went if if Facebook just tried to integrate Bitcoin. Like it, this would have actually worked for them probably. Yeah, I mean, it, they definitely wouldn't have, wouldn't have gotten the same kind of pushback because, I mean, if the U.S. regulators wanted to, I don't know, I don't know if they ever thought that they could pull something like this against Bitcoin. I think they realized pretty early that they couldn't just by the fact that there was no company or CEO to call. And unfortunately for Facebook and for Libra, there's someone to call. Um, so if they... If they actually wanted to implement a system like what they wrote about in the white paper originally, they would have to use something like Bitcoin because they've already put themselves in a position where there's someone to call. And so they're always going to be a vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, it's, it's going to be a funny, funny historical thing to look back on. All right, though. Are we ready to move along into this giant chunk of shit in the mining space? All right. Yep. All right. First up is Canon. Uh, one of the biggest Bitmain competitors in China is publicly filed for an IPO in the United States. Uh, Credit Swiss, Citigroup, uh, Galaxy Digital, and four others signed off as the underwriters. And a lot of information has come out regarding finances. 
uh, this year. Uh, pretty much in 2018, Canon's revenue was just under $400 million with net income of $8.3 million. In 2019 so far, they have lost $45 million. Uh, and their year-to-year -year revenue is down 85% from the same period in 2018. Now, this said, um, they're pretty much 21% of mining machines out there. So, like, just let this sink in for a minute. Like, this is a much smaller scale company than Bitmain. They're getting wrecked as Bitmain is getting wrecked and have that kind of, of market share in terms of the network. Like this IPO is not happening. I like I, I don't see this happening. I, I do not see any serious amount of money going into the mining space again except from the point of view of I'm manufacturing these chips and using them to mine myself. Like it's it's just not going to happen. Like we've seen in 2014 I think the the bear market almost took out Bitmain. They survived by the skin of their teeth. The like this last bull cycle like they they made the most idiotic decisions ever and this bear market are barely getting by with the skin of their teeth like all of these companies involved in, in attempts at ipos in hong kong and now it seems like you know moving to these attempts in the united states are, are not doing well like this is just not a fucking profitable business like from the point of view of not mining yourself like even like gmo one of the biggest conglomerates in japan in, in the technology sector got into mining and then pulled out after one market cycle like they, they're still mining with the equipment they have that makes sense to but they stopped manufacturing they stopped uh external facing sales like that model in the the bitcoin mining market it's not profitable it does not make sense and like i'm gonna eat my fucking hat if any of these IPOs in the U.S. go through, like it's it's just not happening. All right, all right, all right. Next up is some shenanigans going on. So anybody who's been paying attention to Twitter the last couple days will have noticed some interesting stories going on around Bitmain, uh, Jihan Wu and co-CEO McCree Zan. Um, pretty much the board for some reason has put Jihan Wu back in charge, uh, removed Zan, from any kind of managerial or decision-making position in the company. And actually, Jihan has sent out an email, uh, I think this last Tuesday around noon, saying, Bitmain's co-founder, chairman, legal representative, and executive director, Jihan Wu, has decided to dismiss all road or roles of Zan effective immediately. Any Bitmain staff shall no longer take any direction from Zan or participate in any meeting organized by Zan. Bitmain may, based on the situation, consider terminating employment contracts of those who violate this note. And an employee anonymously, uh, or under the condition of anonymity, uh, validated this email and is pretty much framing this as round two of the huge wave of layoffs that happened in 2018 during the, the, the hardest part of the downswing from the, the previous all-time high. So there is some very interesting power struggles going on right now because Chihan was just recently removed from any kind of influential position uh, by the board. 
uh, disconnected from everything after the, the fallout of all their Bcash related decisions. And now this has been abruptly about fixed. And there's really like, like I, I don't understand the logic in this situation or what's going on. Uh, aside from moving in very tin foil hat directions, such as how much influence does the Communist Party have on investors in Bitmain and shareholders? What type of influence could they exert there? Because otherwise, like, what the hell is going on? Jihan was just removed because he made a number of incredibly stupid decisions that had a profoundly negative financial effect on this company. So why is he back now? And Janine, I know you have to have something to say on this. Come on. Well, I, I do have one thing to say on it because people are talking about this being a coup. And so the thing that came to my mind was bit main coup. And that reminded me of Maine Coon cats. So I was thinking of cats. You have no ideas on what's possibly going on here or what the, the deeper motivations between such a radical about face and the boards are. Uh, well, you obviously, you're the one who usually reports on Bitmain stuff. Um, I don't follow them that closely so from a far away view when i was hearing about this stuff yesterday um i don't know it just sounds it just sounds like a very bad time to be doing this kind of power grab that's what i mean like it doesn't make sense like the the pretty much the shareholders in any rational world are concerned with going public recouping some money because they've all just been eviscerated over the last two years or so and that's all jihan's fault so why in the hell would you put him back in charge maybe because he has some uh connections i mean that's the only thing that makes any kind of reasonable sense in my mind otherwise like what are you doing you, are you just gonna light more money on fire but yeah you know and you know speaking of bad timing though this is right after uh information dropped that Bitmain also is actually filing for a uh, initial public offering attempt with the SEC in the United States, and they're sponsored by Deutsche Bank. Well, there was no public information on amounts, but in the last whispers of them considering a IPO in the U.S., they were shooting for three hundred to five hundred million dollars. So down by a huge margin from the $3 billion they were trying to raise through the IPO filing at the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So, like, yeah, it, all of the overall dynamics in the market that just make this not a viable business model. And on top of that, you have these, these power struggles going on between McCree and Jihan now. It's like... What 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 is the Communist Party doing here? Like like seriously, what 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 is the attack plan? Because I don't see anything else going on that makes any goddamn fucking sense. Uh, well, my other guess is that maybe Mark Zuckerberg is right, and China is. Well, I don't know. I feel like they've already built up most of it with the WeChat stuff, but like if China's actually building a more comprehensive financial surveillance system, then maybe Bitmain wants to get behind that considering, you know, how much they're involved in hardware and stuff and that maybe that's why they would have pushed for Jihan to, you know, step up. Mm -hmm. And then another interesting factor is is Deutsche Bank. Like, what's 
what's going on there? Because the last thing I can remember about any kind of business tie with Germany was his whole rambling about private crypto central banks maybe a year or two ago as a speech he gave. And I haven't seen anything since. But now, like, apparently, like, the, the, there is a close enough relationship with Deutsche Bank that they're sponsoring them for a United States IPO. So what, what's going on there? Well, I'm, I may be Deutsch, but I don't, I have no idea about <laughs> why Deutsche Bank would want to be involved in this. would be pretty hilarious if they were just trying to cover in holes in the balance sheet. <laughs> All right, where is that put us? Next up. Okay. So one last thing before it's over to you. Um, Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. So the internet owns but er, Ohm Budsman in Russia, who started Russian uh, mining company, I think it is RMC. They did a $43 million ICO in 2017. Is making a very bold claim that they are shooting to mine 20% of the mined Bitcoin supply. Uh, <laughs> that's their goal. So this is, you know, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical of this based on the ultimate source of this being a coin telegraph writer. But at the same time, like there has been pretty consistent whisperings of mining developments going on in Russia in terms of economic incentives, uh, nice arrangements as far as cheap, uh, purposeable real estate near, um, places of surplus power but that just seems like a crazy goal like where 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 is the money coming i there is no way in hell 43 million dollars from an ico two years ago is going to translate to 20 percent of the network hash rate in any sane world um it is going to be much more investment required than that so is this just like shit talking or is this the first whisperings we are going to see of money eventually moving literally from the Russian government into mining operations? You have to talk. I mean, yeah. Russia Russia should take advantage of the fact that it's shit cold at this time of year and they should get in mining. <laughs> I don't really know what else to say. It just seems like a really logical step, especially as a country that, I mean, I don't know if they are particularly, I don't think they're particularly interested in Bitcoin as like decentralized freedom money, but they would be interested in it if if this narrative continues that bitcoin is a credible threat to us dominance in the financial sector and of course russia likes to challenge us dominance in anything and so of course they're going to jump on the bandwagon of that even if maybe they're not in favor of their own citizens using it to challenge their own dictatorship But what if Russia is really the good guys and we're the baddies? No, the secret is that they're all bad guys. That's not how things work. Did I actually have my mic open for that? Okay, no, I didn't. That's you, Janine, with a nice software development. Go. Yeah, so uh, Lucas Antevero from Argentina had submitted a pull request about one week ago to make some improvements to the coin selection process in Wasabi Wallet. 
um, by taking account of the cluster information. Uh, because when you use Wasabi, if you've ever used Wasabi, you would know that you have to label every coin or not coin, but UTXO that you receive uh, to create a transaction graph that makes it easier for you to see it, the history of where a coin's been and whether um, some UTXOs need to be kept separate. Um, for example, you know, you don't want to be mixing the UTXOs from your salary with, uh, I don't know, the, or you want to be careful about how you mix like the, or yeah. So let's say you have some UTXOs that are your salary and then you have some change UTXO from a transaction that you made to donate to some cause that you believe in. Obviously, if you were to mix those together in a transaction, then whoever it pays your salary, if they would pay attention to you know the trail, they could see where your money is going. So that's the whole idea behind this. And so in the pull request, he wrote that the smart coin selector tries to avoid merging coins from different clusters in order to ma uh, in order to minimize the number of people slash entities that can know about the built transaction. Uh, if, if you want to know more about that terminology, that there's a documentation. And um, so it does that by creating a small set of clusters, combinations uh, sorted by their privacy levels and selecting the best cluster or cluster combination big enough to cover the spending target. Um, and so that pull request went through relatively quick uh, review and appears to have been merged into Wasabi now. So. Um, if you're not familiar with the dirty details of how coin selection stuff works, um, a lot of the conversation in that pull request will probably make no sense to you. So I recommend reading the um, documentation at docs.wasabiwallet.io because they have, uh, in the section, uh, use of Wasabi FAQ, they have questions like, uh, what is cluster history? And what is the difference between send and build transactions? Um, so if any of that is obscurity, you can figure that out by reading that. And I don't know, Shinobi, if you have a more detailed yet understandable way of explaining what exactly this change did, then feel free to give that. Yeah, you pretty much uh, like got it right there. I mean, the like really the only thing I would say is that this is like an important first step in terms of moving towards post mix spending tools. Like Wasabi started off very conservatively in not including automated tools like that because, you know, this is like one, just trying to control everything your user does ultimately doesn't work. If they're set on doing something, they can just send coins to another wallet and do it anyway. But also because like this is all very open like chain analysis is a very young thing um, that has a lot of routes to improve and so they didn't want to start off with assuming this thing is safe and then just like that gets broken later and retroactively fucks everything so they've left users in control like this is the first step towards actually having some kind of intelligent guide or automation to that process and I think that's huge. Like I, I think Nopara said uh, on Twitter, like the the reason they finally ended up moving forward with this is because it made a more intelligent uh, decision than eighty percent of the users. So this was actually something they did user test with to compare against, and that's how you should be moving forward when it comes to privacy, like slow iteration and actually verifying things. So like, I think this is a really awesome step towards dealing with one of the big shortcomings Wasabi had. Ray. All right, next up. Cold Card has dropped specifications to let you build your own cold card that's right they've dropped the entire schematic and circuit diagram for the entire device as well as a complete list of all of the actual chips and and, and such and fancy hardware things that you need to stick on the device to make it work and where to buy it and you can slap that shit together yourself so this is 
something they initially did mostly just for security researchers to be able to test and verify the entire device all, all the way down as far as they can. But ultimately, uh, the, like if you want to, you can just do this and build your own device. If, if you're in a, an area where you can't get a cold card or it presents attack vectors in transit that you're not comfortable with. Or if you're just that confident you can do a better job of securing everything in the assembly process than, than CoinCard, you can go ahead and do that. You can put the whole thing together yourself, take the open source firmware and load it, and have a functioning cold card. So this is really fucking awesome, just from every level. Like this is in, in helping actually solidify the, the current design by giving these tools to security researchers and opening up the ability to actually put this together yourself if, if that's your trust model you're most comfortable or capable with like i mean how you could even take this to the level of spinning this off and uh i don't know go start your own fucking company if you want to be an asshole but yeah this is all out in the open right now and i think this is going to be uh Pretty fucking neato. Ah, this is like pulling teeth, Janine. Bah. Pulling teeth. Alrighty. My last story of the day. So. If you guys were paying attention to things, you saw somebody lost four whole Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. Um, no. No, they didn't. Uh, that's complete horseshit. Uh, so Rusty, uh, Rusty Russell from Blockstream, after seeing this, decided to dig around a bit. And he checked the block intervals, um, 600,000 to 601,000, um, which is where there should have been evidence of this penalty transaction happening. And nope, nothing. Nothing in that entire block range, not a single non-cooperative penalty, anything in those entire thousand blocks. And then... He took it to a whole new level and wound it back to block 590,000 all the way to 601,000. There's only six penalty transactions and all of them together are not even close to four Bitcoin. Not even close. So this entire story was complete horseshit. This was a fabrication. And the little cherry on top I want to point out is that this was literally a day or two before the second Bitcoin BSV debate uh, Hotep Jesus did with Guy Swan and the lunatic who kept uh, waving a raspberry pie around and screaming. And uh, this was a big talking point brought up there. So uh, I think it's pretty fucking obvious this was a complete fabrication to let some pathetic lunatic have a single argument that he could point to with evidence to shred the, the fucking core brainwashed idiot's argument or whatever the fuck. So yeah, uh, that's what happened. Fake news. You gotta have an opinion, Jeannie. You gotta have an opinion. Well, as someone who wrote a uh, very long uh, blog post about fake news around Lightning Network, that does not surprise me at all. Alrighty. I think you're up now for the last three, uh, and that's that. That's it. Uh, this, this next one should be really, really fucking stupid. Oh, oh yeah, definitely is. Um, so for anyone who hasn't heard, for some reason, Bitfinex has launched a public leaderboard for who is the best trader on their platform based on various metrics like realized profit, unrealized profit, and volume. 
And on October 29th, they tweeted encouragement for people to connect, not just people, but their own users to connect their Twitter profiles to their Bitfinex account to show everyone your rating skills. Now, I just want to say that you people at Bitfinex are fucking morons for allowing this, and anyone who opts into this is a fucking moron too, especially if your real identity is connected to your Twitter account because you are basically advertising to the entire world exactly how much money you are throwing around and painting a giant red target on your back. So let me say that again, you are all morons, and you all deserve the harassment you will inevitably get if there is a large movement in the market and someone finds your handle on the leaderboard and decides to put all the blame on you. Boom! Not to mention tax audits. Retards. I, I mean, inevitably, there was a person responding to the tweet saying, like, are you guys working for the IRS now? <laughs> like, <laughs> seriously, anyone who's doing this, you're... You're basically saying, hello, IRS, come get me, I'm right here. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It really is just absolutely amazing, the enormous level of complete fucking retard necessary to think this is a good idea. Like, it it really is, it's, it's amazing. And, I mean, I don't know, if it was me and I was, I don't know if you want to take the risk of having the IRS come after you, I mean, you also have the other problem where, I don't know, can you guarantee the accuracy of the information that's on the leaderboard? Uh, Like, what if it misrepresents the amount of volume you're doing or your unrealized profit or whatever? Like, if the, if the IRS is smart, they're going to be watching this, and if what you report differs in any way from what is being projected on this leaderboard, they're going to be like, well, uh, which one do we trust more? <laughs> like, And it's probably not going to be you. Not to mention, let's see how many idiots uh, trading from the U.S. who shouldn't be do that. Yeah, (laughs) I mean, you probably, yeah. So, just bad decision making all around. Yep. But I'm sure that if Libra somehow manages to bootstrap itself, they're going to have a similar thing. Like, hey, are you a great Libra user? Cut your Facebook account and share your, I don't know, <laughs> your, your uh, coffee. Did I just say coffee? Wow, that is the weirdest <laughs> pronunciation I've ever... Anyway, I don't drink coffee, so I'm giving myself it. Anyway, yeah. Share all your coffee spends with your friends on Facebook. All right. What is up next? Um. Well, this is just another <laughs> cup ca- cafe. Yeah. This is another example of um people doing stupid things or believing stupid things. Um. Basically, Genesis Mining did a survey of one thousand people uh, through twenty three questions about uh, how well the average American consumer understood the Federal Reserve banking and fiat money. And apparently they did the survey on September 19th. I don't, I didn't look far enough to see what their methodology was. Most of these types of surveys are done online. Um, but their key findings as reported on PR Newswire um, says that 24% uh, percent of respondents believe that the Federal Reserve is responsible for securing US gold reserves while 50% responded that they are responsible for overseeing U.S. monetary policy. Uh, Let's see some other ones. Uh, 29% uh, of respondents believe that the U.S. dollar is still backed by gold. Oh, no. Um, And we were actually having a a conversation about this the other day, and it was about how even if you go into a bank and you, you ask these types of questions of the tellers of the banks, I mean... Maybe the smarter ones are just going to lie to you, but a lot of them actually genuinely believe this too. Like, they're not any smarter than the average person. So, uh, what are some other things? Um, Oh, 26% of respondents believe that banks are required to keep 100% of the money deposited by customers in the bank. Woo! 
Well, 52% responded that banks do not need to keep... Okay, so slightly smarter. We have a 50% majority of smart people who believe that banks do not need to keep 100%. Um, of those that said no, banks do not need to hold 100% of customer deposits in reserve. Just 9% believed that banks must hold 1% to 10%. Okay, so we're not quite that smart. <laughs> not as smart as we wanted. Uh, what's another one? Uh, 54% of respondents believe that the Federal Reserve is uh, solely owned by the U. Wait, the Federal Reserve banks are solely owned by the U.S. government. All righty. Uh, 30% of respondents report that they hardly ever use cash, while 37% reported that they use cash just one to two times per week. Oh dear. Well, that's a lot higher in Germany, I can tell you that. Um, 76% of people oppose the idea of the U.S. government replacing paper money with digital only money. So that's, that's pretty, that's good. Okay, so we're not using cash, but we still are in favor of keeping cash around. Uh, not bad. So yeah, uh, they're, you know, quite significant amount of uh, stupidity. I wish I could know more about, you know, because this was a relatively, I mean, a thousand respondents is not a huge number, and I'd like to know more about uh, who this was done with. But yeah, some interesting statistics. Yeah, I mean, even if you don't know the methodology, though, like, depending on how you look at it, it's still pretty fucked. I mean, like, if it was biased to people close to the Bitcoin space, then, oh my god, that's that's even more atrocious. Like, and if that's the case, then, like, what would something that accounts for that bias and get outside of it look like? Like, would people even, like, would those percentages of people who understood shit be even lower? But, like, regardless of how you try to account for methodology, like, it just says, like, that's what we have to get past to really make people understand why Bitcoin. Like, they don't understand finance in general. They have to learn that first. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, it's not even learning math. It's just learning the the just the basic power structure of how money works. Um, this was another thing I was talking about um, about a week ago, um, where it was a conversation about like why to use cash and not digital money. And one of the reasons for using cash is just because like it's so the system is so simple. You know, you just give them the piece of paper and it's. And it's over and it's like on some level that's true like it is very simple you know there's no facebook connect buttons tracking you and all of that but at the same time you know even though cash in the fiat system is superior at least in my book it's superior to digital fiat um it's like the whole fiat system is still extremely complex complicated, extremely bureaucratic, and full of black boxes that people don't know about. So it seems simple on its face, but if people actually understood how that cash came to be in their hand and how that cash came to be valued, uh, they would realize it's not that simple. Um, the, so the main thing from this survey that was obviously displayed was about what is the U.S. dollar backed by, and I just want to read because there was actually there was actually a lot of options for responses to that question. And so 29% said gold, 4% uh, said oil, 5.8% said bonds, 30% said the U.S. government, 7% uh, said nothing, and 23% said I don't know. So actually a lot of people willing to be honest and say I don't know. <laughs> Oh, that's promising, at least. It's still, like, there is a mountain to get across before people really understand this stuff well enough to be, to be motivated. All right. Well, I guess, uh, do you have anything else on this, or you want to get this last one out of the way? Nope, I am ready to go into the shitcoin exchange news. Woo! Let's go. So, uh, Poloniex, I believe this announcement was on the... Oh, it was way back in October 18th, so we missed this. Um, but Poloniex announced back in October 18th that um, they will be 
quote, spinning out from Circle into a new company, Polo Digital Assets, with the backing of a major investment group, which I don't actually remember if they said who that was. No, they don't. They actually don't. They just say investment from a group. Uh, so this shouldn't have really been too big of an announcement in itself, uh, just a kind of shifting around of paperwork. Um, but they said, oh, our new offer uh, to traders is that there will be reduce spot trading fees, blah, blah, blah. But then their other announcement is that, um, unfortunately, in order to be competitive in the global market, we will not be able to include U.S. customers in the spin out. So Circle will be winding down operations for U.S. Poloniex users uh, or U.S. Poloniex customers. Beginning today, U.S. persons will no longer be able to create new accounts starting on November 1st, which is today. Uh, U.S. customers will no longer be able to execute trades on the exchange. When trading ends, U.S. customers will be able to, uh, you'll still be able to withdraw your assets through Circle until at least December 15th. So you have a, a month and a half to take out your money from this exchange that no longer wants you. Woo! No one gives a shit. But don't bump. So that's it for Polo. Uh... I think they're they're pretty much fucked. Uh, they lost all their market share with all the regulatory bullshit. They're trying to spin off to compensate for that, and I don't think they'll succeed. Bye, Polo. Marco Polo. Alrighty. So, uh, got any final thoughts, Janine? Uh, final thoughts. Let's see. Uh, let me look. You can do yours. Uh, I'm going to do stuff in the near future and then post it on the internet. I am also going to do that, although I don't know if people will know that it's me posting stuff about what I'm doing on the internet. Ha! So uh, the only final thought I really have, um, I know that there's going to be a lot of rallies happening in the next month or two for Assange, especially in the UK, but there's also a lot of stuff happening in elsewhere in Europe. And the United States and Australia and places like that. Um, the only big update uh, that there really is is that um, I've mentioned a number of times that a investigative journalist, Stefania, has been um, trying to do freedom of, freedom of information requests to various countries, authorities in the countries like the UK Metropolitan Police, um, the Swedish government, uh, specifically, I think the prosecution office, and also in Ecuador now because of what's been going on uh, in the last year, uh, kicking Assange out of the embassy and everything. Um, and the FOIA request in the UK has gone relatively badly because the UK sucks and uh, their justice system is twisting itself in knots in order to make sure that Assange stays in prison. So um, one of her FOIA, um, I'm not sure if this is the same one, but basically she appealed one of her FOIA requests against Scotland Yard to obtain the correspondence between them and the U.S. on various WikiLeaks people, um, Assange, uh, Sarah Harrison, and I believe also a guy from CIJ, um, Joseph Farrell, and um, Kristen Harafneson. Uh, about just what were they discussing and so they've uh, she announced yesterday that she appealed their refusal to release the documents and that appeal will now be going to the first tier tribunal in London um, for anyone who doesn't know there's like multiple stages uh, or tribunals that a FOIA request goes through in the UK and the first tier tribunal is um, 
the like it's the first one you go through and then i think there's ones above that um if your if your uh request doesn't get the response that you want you can then appeal it to upper tier tribunals oh my god i can't even fucking pay attention to that shit anymore without fucking getting pissed and sad and at the same fucking time it's just yeah. <sighs> oh, got got it. Uh, I mean, I can't. I can't really. I can't really ignore it, even if I wanted to. So I'm just gonna keep uh, giving updates. If you haven't heard in previous episodes, I've been um, basically summarizing relevant updates on my little, really rackety blog. Um, the latest one is your heroes for ghosts and it's the top one or I think it's the top one Yeah, it's the top one. You can find it on my blog That I can link in the description again um, If you want to it's basically a chronological timeline of what's been happening Since roughly August if you want to see stuff that's earlier than that you can check out two other posts that have a lot more summaries <laughs> They're not really even summaries anymore uh, So very long, but yeah, if you want to be able to sift through it very easily. I've been doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll put that in the uh, the show notes before this actually goes up. But yeah, on that note, uh, you know, it's a little shorter than usual and it probably will be until uh, Nopar gets out of Taiwan, guys. But keep an eye out for the Shy 256s picking up steam and special editions picking up steam lately. Uh, we'll see you next time, punks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>